Um, so I wanted to do just a little bit more context to give um, people a sense of what my role as a public sociologist has been in uh, Syringa. And you can, um, so part of what public sociology is about, and there's this scholar, Michael Burlboy, over at UC Berkeley, who became famous in the mid, well, about 2009, I think, is when he presented this speech with the American Sociological Association, um, saying it's important for us to get out of the ivory towers and actually make meaning out of our disciplines. And so um, I've been very much uh, inspired by this idea that, of trying to do that. And so what I've been interested in is trying to figure out ways to listen to community members, such as the case is right now with Syringa residents, to listen to them pinpoint from their expertise, because they have a vantage point that many people from outside do not understand, and trying to help them show us where the solutions need to be focusing. And uh, this is a picture, and uh, I think Dave McGraw and Tom Lamar might remember this day pretty clearly. In uh, March 25, 2015, when uh, uh, Don Tatchell, among other residents, uh, organized a meeting at, with the Laetai County Commissioners out at the park in the rec center. And it was largely to be able to uh, voice their concerns about what was happening, um, that they weren't seeing improvements yet, and wondering um, how the county might be able to um, intervene on some of this. And uh, it was quite an emotional um, meeting. So um, with public sociology, what I've been doing is ever since this date, which was pretty much my first time ever stepping into Syringa Mobile Home Park, um, I've been exploring all of the different avenues. I've been meeting with residents when I've been able to, um, and more now than ever before, because with closure, their needs are amplified um, thousandfold. And uh, I'm finding that at least being able to talk is helping them slightly get through all of um, this stress. Um, so that's what public sociology is, and I can go on and on in an academic conference somewhere for you to give you the ins and outs of that. So one of the things that I'd like to highlight about what this case seems to reveal, and it may not be a surprise to a lot of people, is that the context of our state is shaping a lot of the limitations of power to try to help. And what I've found really frustrating since uh, really paying attention to what's been going on with Syringa Mobile Home Park is that there's a lot of good hearts looking at this case, and yet it's as though, I've, I've told several residents, it's as though they're in this glass bubble where we can see that they need help, but there aren't any real uh, laws that help us regulate and to try to come in and intervene and protect. Um, that's what I feel like I'm seeing, and the example being that Idaho DEQ has an approach of trying to help private property owners to voluntarily abide by the laws that are out there. And that's not new. There are other states um, where this is seen and when we look at environmental justice cases. Idaho being one of those, where it's a little bit harder for the environmental quality agencies to intervene in a more direct fashion. We see, too, that county uh, officials are also hamstrung in terms of what they are able to do to intervene on this type of a situation. And um, it, again, it's the same old story, perhaps, that we're familiar with, is that the rich get fines, the poor get jail, right? And that's certainly what Syringa Boba Home Park seems to be showing once again. And um, so it's important for us, even though there might be um, critiques of how different agencies may have, may or may not have been involved, is to understand that it's within this larger context of what, how laws have been written to protect private property ownership of certain types over others. Um, and what I want to pursue a little bit further, um, I want to focus mostly on residents' experiences right now, 
because that's what the most immediate concern is. But as I'm exploring this, I want to understand, too, how it is that we have neighboring states that have had a little bit more teeth when they've been trying to address similar types of issues. One with Mag Magar e Magar um, at Riverwood Mobile Home Park in Oregon. Oregon's environmental quality agencies actually had a little bit more teeth and been able to um, get Magar to act a little bit more um, precisely on these issues. And again, that is a mobile home park, much like Syringa, where the sewage and water pipes are owned by that landowner, and so he has the ultimate responsibility to keep track of it. So, um, so those are interesting things. And then um, in Washington State, uh, Washington State has an attorney general that actually intervened and advocated on behalf of migrant workers um, living in Madawa, Washington, and that was just this last fall. So, um, so one of the things that's very interesting from a, my perspective is looking at how we can be so closely um, networked together as states and yet vastly different outcomes for different mobile home parks. Um, and this also is seen in the way that closures are dealt with. So we have June 5th is most likely going to be, that's what the bankruptcy settlement says, is the ultimate date for people to move out of Syringa Park. But in, again, in Oregon and Washington, the regulation is that they get a full year, they get 12 months. So that's one difference um, to think about. And moreover, Oregon even um, makes park owners give money to those homeowners so that they have at least some nugget of money to try to get out of the park, since it's not their decision to, to close the park. So those are some things that I think are we need to think in terms of larger context as we also think about what is happening and why is it that Syringa Mobile Home Park residents and mainly homeowners and some renters are, are faced with this struggle. Um, the final thing I want us to think about, too, is what we're losing in Lata County with Syringa's closure. Um, Ann Thompson, who is a staff member at University of Idaho, gave me these photos. When she found out that I was going to put on this event, she said, I have photos of back when it was really nice in the early and mid-80s where the indoor swimming pool was clean and people had parties. Dave McGraw, I know, told me a story about going to parties out there to swim as in high school, right? And so I finally found someone who had at least some of those pictures. And I'm still looking for more if you know people that have some of these pictures because this is what we lose when we don't know Syringa beyond this case. And that's why I want the residents to be able to talk tonight, because the case has made us focus so much on the park being a problem that I think it's built this idea that Syringa residents are a problem themselves. And I'm hoping we can move away from that thinking. Clearly people who are here are willing to do that. Um, so uh, Anne uh, sent me an email and she said, when the, these pictures those were good years. My son was born out there. It was our first home that we purchased. We lived paycheck to paycheck. We loved it out there because it was like country living and felt rich because there was also a pool. It was our first start in life as a married couple. <coughs> Syringa has been that for young families. Syringa has been that for retirees. There's still a couple out there right now that retired out there right before Magar bought the place in the early 80s, thinking that that was where they were going to get to retire and live the rest of their years. Um, so, and also too, this has been a place where a lot of college students, undergrads, graduates, they've lived out there as well. So, um, so this is the kind of stuff we're losing. And I have one more slide. <laughs> and you can, it does it bullet by bullet, okay. So who lives out of the park? And um, in early October this past year, in 2017, um, 
I, the UI Legal Aid Clinic brought all of the residents together to discuss um, the imminent closure of the park. And uh, while we were there, I asked residents to fill out a survey. So of the people that attended, 23 households filled out these surveys that the students helped administer. And what we found is that, you know, in the past we had traditionally young people and retirees going out there. Um, today, as of now, there's nine children still living out of the park. There used to be a lot more, but there are still nine children, a few of which are special needs children, and um, they're living out in the park. Um, there's a few more if you go with the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. It's uh, up to, I think, 14 children who are 21 years or younger. That's what the Idaho Department of Health and Wel Welfare uses. And uh, most of these, uh, how, uh, the median age range for these households is between the years of 50 to 59. Um, the residents, um, most of them are working, and they're in the service sector. They're uh, working at grocery stores, retail outlets, in the health industry, in higher ed and sciences, property sales, and there's even self-employed people, one of which is maybe someone who's driven you in a taxi, in wildcat taxi, who was not able to make it tonight, Denise James. Ah, are you making it? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, 14 of these 23 households report having at least one family member who has chronic <coughs> who suffers from chronic pain and health issues. And for many of these households, you hear over and over again that pets were one of the, one of the major driving forces as well for moving out to um, both have privacy and to be able to have pets, which are not usually allowed in town if you're having to rent. And uh, 20, of these 23 families together, they're taking care of 40 dogs and over 49 cats because, yeah, Syringa has a lot of feral cats and people have big hearts out there and they're feeding them all. So um, I think that that's the end of my little introduction. Had to insert a little bit of uh, public sociology there.